This incident occurred just last week, and it's fresh in my mind. Basically, I work in a bar. I work four days a week. I work Tuesday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I was working my Tuesday shift, to which I work by myself. It's usually not that busy. So when it comes for the end of my shift, I'm sharp when leaving at 12 a.m. to get the last bus home. On this night, the bar was busier than usual, and my boss, who stays up upstairs in the flat above, was on holiday. I called last orders and was preparing for my cleaning duties when an older man, about 40, came to the bar. I'm going to call him Mr. Strange. As I had called last orders ten minutes before the till was locked and I couldn't serve more alcohol, this was our brief conversation. Hello, beautiful. Can I have a beer? Sorry, I called last orders minutes ago, so we can't serve you anymore. He didn't take to this very well and started calling not very nice names. I simply ignored this and everyone was out of the bar by 12.15 a.m. I locked the entrance door, but I had left the back entrance to the bar open as I had to take out the trash. I come back from taking out the trash lock the door and hear some strange noises in the bar. I went into panic mode, as I know my boss isn't home, and everyone was out several minutes before. I make my way upstairs and notice Mr. Strange sitting on the bar stool. The look he gives me still gives me the chills, as he had the most piercing black eyes that would claim your very soul. I tell Mr. Strange that we were closed, and he should have left by now to which he answers. Oh, I know. I waited in the bathroom for everyone to go. I noticed you behind the bar, and you were simply beautiful. Me being me, I got embarrassed and proceeded to tell him to leave, which he refused. Suddenly he pounces and runs into the hall, which connects the inside bar, where he was sitting across from me. I was in full panic mode, and knew that this is how I was going to die. He stands and corners me. We make awkward eye contact with each other. Suddenly he starts trashing the bar area, smashing bottles and pouring alcohol everywhere. He was in a fit of rage. Luckily my boss has CCTV hooked up to his phone and saw the incident. My boss called his brother who then called the police and they arrived soon after he started trashing the place. He was arrested. Turns out he was high on drugs at the time. He claimed to not remember anything. So Mr. Strange, let's not meet again, as you left me terrified to work alone at night. This happened when I was around eight or nine. I grew up in a pretty safe neighborhood that happened to be close to a large golf course that had and still has a huge annual tournament. If you know anything about golf, you can probably figure out where this is. The tournament lasts for several days and every year, thousands of people travel to the city to attend. Unfortunately, that means some weirdos come to town as well. I was playing out in my front yard with two friends. One girl who was my best friend. She was the same age. She lived down the street from me. And another slightly older girl who lived in the opposite end of the street from me. At this age, my mom no longer felt that she had to sit outside and watch me while I played. But she would occasionally look out the window to check on me. We were playing on our bikes when all of a sudden the silver car pulled up right next to us on the road. There was a man in the driver's seat with his window all the way down. I don't remember much about how he looked except he was white with dark hair, but I'll never forget the creepy ear-to-ear grin he wore. He asked if we could show him where the baseball fields at the school were. I lived very close to an elementary school with baseball fields across from it. My slightly older friend, who was unfortunately far too naive and trusting, told him sure. She knew exactly where they were, and she could get on her bike and take them there. Meanwhile, I was scared shitless, 
and I was frantically trying to mouth to my best friend, don't talk to strangers, because something about this man was making me very uncomfortable, and I knew we shouldn't be talking to him, but I was too afraid to say it out loud and possibly anger him. Then the guy asks, mouth still stretched in the creepy grin, do you want to know a secret? Beckoning us to come closer to his car. Silently, we all shook our heads, too afraid to speak, and even my naive friend had enough sense not to approach that car. Are you sure? You sure you don't want to know a secret? Still grinning. Again, we all nodded no. Surprisingly, he just said okay, and then drove off. I immediately went inside and told my mom what had happened. She phoned the police. Luckily, my older brother, who was a teenager at the time, happened to catch a glimpse of the car right before it had pulled away and was able to identify it as a Grand Am. The police came out to our house and told us that two other girls had reported the same man in the same car, asking them if they would show him where the baseball fields were. In a twist of fate, a few hours later, the two teenage girls who lived next door to my best friend came to get her so they could walk her home. They told us that they were the ones who had been approached by the same man and asked about the baseball fields. Luckily, they had trusted their gut and hadn't gone with him either. The police never did find the guy, but my mom was convinced he was someone in town for the golf tournament, which was occurring at the time. Fortunately, we never heard the news that anyone had actually been kidnapped. So creepy man with a Cheshire grin, who wants to share your secret? Let's not meet. So I pretty much grew up in a nice little neighborhood, where all the family kids played together. We all went to the same school. All the parents knew us, and we were free to roam as long as we were home before the street lights came on. We pretty much knew everyone, or at least recognized them, if they lived in the same area. Here's where the guy in the wheelchair comes in. He's well known. He was always strolling through the streets. He actually lived on the same street a few houses down. No one ever really talked to him. He stuck in his own group of friends. He always gave me a weird vibe anytime I came across him, but never gave me a reason to totally not trust him. One day, my sister and I were maybe six and ten at the time. We were riding our bikes as we usually do when the guy on the wheelchair turned onto our street. My gut told me something was off, so I slowed down my bike and told my sister to ride ahead of me. Then the guy rolls faster and tells us he needs help. I instantly tell him, no, we need to go home. He keeps saying, I really need help. Please help me. I tell my sister to ride as fast as she can home, and this guy no shit stands up, starts running after us. We jump off our bikes and run inside telling my dad what happened. Long story short, my dad and my older cousin went down to his house, where he was sitting outside with his friends. My dad yells at us to stay inside. Apparently my dad pistol whipped him and told him to never even look at our direction again. Needless to say, any time he sees us, he would roll his ass over to the other side of the street. One night, after having a few drinks, I came home to my small house where I lived with two other girls, probably around 2.30 a.m. We were all serious students. I was probably the least serious, actually. And when we partied, it was not your typical UCSB Mega Rager more like a small get-together with friends. We would often have a few people spend the night, sleep on our furniture or on our beds as the case may be. That night, my roommates had a few people over who I didn't know, and I saw when I returned home that one of them had opted to sleep on the couch from the shadow that I saw there. I didn't turn the light, so I wouldn't wake anybody up, but as I was passing the couch to enter my bedroom, I noticed that the figure was lying very stiff. He just had this weird energy to him. He was lying down, 
but it was like he was putting all of his energy into lying as still and as rigid as possible. I paused, and the guy quickly jerked his head to face me without moving his limbs so quickly that it startled me. I could see his wide open eyes glinting in the dark, figuring that I had startled him or that he was drunk or maybe on some kind of stimulant and unable to sleep. I just hurried past into my bedroom and locked the door. The dude made me so nervous and I wasn't taking any chances. I fell asleep. At 4.30 a.m. I woke up. There was a strange sound at the door, almost like somebody was drumming their fingers against the wood very quietly. I lay still and listened. There were more quiet sounds like someone scratching the door with their fingers, which got louder and louder until it was clear that he was putting both his hands against the door and scratching as fast and as hard as possible. It created an extremely loud and intimidating sound that filled me with fear. I got my cell phone and texted my roommate because I was afraid to make a sound. Your friend is freaking me out. Is he drunk or something? Can you talk to him? He's banging and scratching on my door. She didn't text me back. Probably because she was asleep. I texted my other roommate to the same effect covering all of my bases. Keep in mind that the scratching at the door has been going on at this point for a couple of minutes. I have no idea how he could have sustained it that long. Scratching at a wooden door with your fingernails cannot feel good. He also grabbed at the knob and jiggled it super forcefully. Because neither of them had answered. I decided to really call them and wake them up, although I was scared to make a sound. I know it sounds stupid, but there was something seriously horrifying about a man teasing me through the other side of my door. I knew that he was trying to terrify me. I felt like a little kid, but I could tell this guy was fucked up or something, and maybe the police needed to be called. And I wanted to loop my roommates in on it, since they were my friends. The scratching stopped abruptly, and I called my roommate, who answered sleepily. Yo, your friend is messed up. Can you please deal with it? Do we need to get the cops involved? He's seriously scaring me, and he won't stop scratching at my bedroom door. It's really fucking weird. He didn't say anything for several seconds, and when she did speak, her voice had no sleepiness at all. What friend? She said. That fucking guy who was sleeping on the couch. I said. She was quiet again. A few seconds had passed by. We didn't have any guys over. She said. Call the police. My adrenaline surged and I told her to please lock the bedroom door as quickly as possible. I realized that I had not heard the scratching in a while. And I had no clue on where that dude had gone. Suddenly, I heard a loud banging at the other end of the house, where my roommates Laura and Monica had shared a bedroom. The bangs were followed by the sound of them screaming in fear. I quickly dialed the police as the maniac proceeded to bang against the luckily locked bedroom door of my two roommates as they screamed. The heaviness of the blows left no doubt that he was trying to break the damn door down. I had told the 911 operator the situation and she dispatched two squad cars. The police in Ista Vista are generally used to taking drunks off the sidewalk and breaking up brawls. This was really serious and strange, and I think the dispatcher got the sense from my tone on how terrified I was, and she stayed on the phone with me. At one point, the banging stopped and everything was quiet for a while. I talked with the dispatcher and suddenly looked down to see that this guy had slipped his fingers through the one inch gap between my door and the floor and was just wiggling them around, making this weird growling sound with it. I screamed and backed away, which is my biggest regret about this situation, since when I look back at it, it would have been so awesome just to stomp the shit out of these fingers and hear this guy howl in pain. When the cops rolled up, I heard running and the sound of our sliding glass door opening and closing, and then he was gone. 
the cops never caught him. He had broken in through our side door by jimmying the lock somehow. My door was covered in what turned out to be huge gouges he made using a pair of scissors, which he discarded on the ground before he left. What terrifies me the most about this was that I walked right past him. I looked him right in the fucking face. I realize now that he was not trying to sleep or he wasn't on drugs, but he was lying so stiff like he was hiding. He probably heard me open the door and freaked out because he hadn't realized there was another girl living there and tried to blend into the couch in the darkness. Finding dreams in my sleep is next to impossible now, but it wasn't always that way. One of the most memorable dreams I remember happened when I was just a very child and haunted me for a very long time. I found little in my lifetime that could explain what I witnessed and experienced during that dream, but I still remember it as one of the worst nightmares I have ever experienced. I have been forgetting many of the ones from the past. And I want to write this one down before I forget. With that said, let's begin recalling this twisted night. I was awoken in the middle of the night, sweating and in tears. I was scared awake by the lightning and rain that stormed just outside of my bedroom window. I glanced over at my alarm clock to gain some sense of what time it was. My clock showed 4.56 AM and further puzzled me as the sun hadn't broken and everything aside from the lightning outside was pitch dark. I looked around in the darkness, trying to stand up out of my bed and gain a better sense of my surroundings. But as soon as I walked over to my alarm clock to see if it was properly set, my mother rushed into my room without warning, slamming my bedroom door in the process. She reached over and grabbed me without hesitation. Come on, Adam, we're going to be late. I had no recollection of any set date or meeting. There was no school today according to the alarm clock, and my mother's panic only further amplified my feelings of dread. I was forced to quickly dress in a pair of pants, slip on some shoes, and put on my best jacket. My mother thought I was delaying her and called out to me to hurry up. Hurry up! We need to deliver this letter! I ran to my mother's car without question and jumped into the back seat. We rode through the darkness and rain, the large droplets sounding off like beating hammers on the top of my mother's car. Every moment I was with her further added to my feelings of dread. We rode on into the distance, past my neighborhood, past all the flickering streetlights, and past all of the businesses in my town. We rode on through the seemingly desolate town with no incident. The streetlights were out, so my mother rode on through them and through the storm. She kept muttering under her breath about the letter. Gotta get this letter out to them. I just have to. And only Adam can do it. We rode on past the businesses and on towards the border of Mexico. The trees rose around us as the water from the nearby river gave the growth sustenance and hid our surroundings from us. We drove on past the trees and made it to the border. An old man awaited us there and asked my mother for the passport. She immediately handed the document over to him and he stamped the small booklet before handing it back to my mother. He asked my mother where we were going in Mexico. I knew very little Spanish then but my mother's reply in Spanish only served to send a deep chill down my spine. We are going to send a letter to the Green Asylum. The guard understood and nodded his head in approval, but looked at me with a face he would only bestow upon someone who was about to perish. I began to panic and tried to climb out of the car, but my mother fought to keep me calm and under control. We drove across the river and into Mexico as tears began to streak more and more across my face. I didn't want to go there after hearing the rumors of that place. I'd only heard of such a place in rumors and legends, but anyone who was sent there never made it back. I looked to unlock the car and unlock my seatbelt so I could get out, but my mother pulled the vehicle over and tied my hands together with a zip tie to the door. As much as I fought my bonds and fought my mother with words, I wasn't going anywhere but with her. After a short drive down a long and muddy road through more ever-rising trees, we finally arrived at what my mother called El Verde Asilo, or the Green Asylum. The asylum loomed over us as an old Spanish prison that was outfitted to take asylum patients. The building itself appeared to be very old and lacked any proper care. 
with vines lining the sides of the building. It almost resembled a castle from another world and another time. It appeared lifeless from the outside. No lights or other indications of anyone inside. The walls of the asylum were cracked and showed their age. My mother rolled down the window and unlocked my door. In her hand was the letter she wanted to deliver and handed it to me. Take this letter to the front door and slide it under the door. I looked back at my mother, my nerves preventing me from moving. What happens when I give them the letter? My mother grew to a boiling fury and screamed at me. Get out of the car! Now! I stepped out of the car and slowly walked up to the asylum. I trudged along as I made my way to the door. My mother continued to scream at me from the car. Watch out for the arms! And as my mother screamed this warning to me, a hand reached out to me from the bars of one of the windows. The arm looked diseased and the person beyond the bar was screaming at me in Spanish. Come here, boy! Come to me! I flung my body against the wall, inching my way slowly to the door, doing my best to avoid the outreaching arm. I took the letter and slid it partially under the door. I waited for a few minutes as I watched the letter under the door. I breathed in an air of relief when I saw the letter taken by someone beyond it. I finally felt a sense of relief and slowly started to walk back towards my mother's vehicle. But as I looked up, I saw my mother driving away. I screamed at her not to leave me. I began to run, screaming at her, hoping she would hear me. But before I was able to make it out to the dirt road, I felt a hand wrap around my waist and that same arm that reached out to me covered my mouth, stifling my shrieks of terror and cries for help. No matter how much I struggled, my captor had me clasped in their grip. No amount of struggling would free me. I was dragged into the asylum by my captors and was thrown quickly into a wooden chair. Leather straps were bound to me and the door slowly closed on me as I screamed in horror, begging for someone, anyone to save me. But my vision was quickly cut off by a blindfold to my eyes and a large slam to my head. I was a part of the asylum now, and they weren't planning on letting me go. This dream is one of the last few I remember from my childhood. The main reason I remember it so well is because it was the worst night terror I had ever experienced. The effects of the dream forced me awake screaming and caused my body to instinctively run directly off of my bed and into the inner walls of my closet as I broke the doors that were in the way. I have never experienced a dream as terrifying as this one, and I hope I never experience a night terror like this again. But I feel this is probably the one dream I will never forget, no matter how many more years I continue not to experience any dreams.